just needed for some technical issues. Uh, so please stay with us and yeah, we will start uh, the event briefly. Thank you. Uh, if it has prepared them well for what challenges uh, they can meet on the job market, if they have the necessary skills that actually the employers look for. So these are a few questions for which we will look for answers at our panel. Uh, our speakers will share their personal experiences, their observations, but also their opinions uh, and their ideas of how different problems that we can observe in this topic could be tackled. Uh, so here today with us, uh, we have the following speakers. I would quickly introduce them. Uh, the first speaker will be Tantia Manders from Insight. She's from Netherlands, she's self-employed translator and a teacher-to-be. She works as an assistant manager for Insight, a company that focuses on educating and empowering children online, promoting and protecting their rights. And Tantia will give us presentation about the research by Dynamic Coalition uh, on Internet, uh, Standards, Security and Safety, uh, who uh, which uh, this uh, research was an inspiration for today's panel and uh, this would be the first time we could hear some parts of this research publicly then uh, in I think an hour there will be an uh, official announcement of the research uh, but here we will have some kind of teaser uh, and Tantia will uh, present us uh, some uh, selected issues from this research. Also here today uh, on my left there's Anna Rufczynska from NASK. Uh, 
Uh, she is coordinator of the Polish Safer Internet Center at NASC uh, and a researcher in the field of digital technologies in the context of cultural phenomena and social practices and specialist in promotion activities in the field of child and youth on, uh, online safety. She's also the author of publications and educational tools and a member of international working expert groups. In 2018, she was listed among 100 persons recognized for their contribution to the development of digital competence in Poland. Mm, on my right, there is Nancy Vahira uh, from North America School of Internet Governance. Uh, she is a member of North America Regional at Large Organization, uh, have a Bachelor of Science in Business Information Technology, and uh, she has over five years of experience as a technical support and she recently graduated from a two years diploma program in cybersecurity in a community college in Canada. On my further right, there's uh, Samaila Atsenbako, uh, the director of communication cyber in Cybersecurity Expert Association of Nigeria. Nigeria. And he is a cybersecurity professional with interest in cybersecurity awareness, uh, cybersecurity awareness and culture, digital forensics, internet governance, and leadership. He provides training, consultancy, and advisory services to SMEs and startups within and outside Nigeria. He was listed as an IFSEC, Global Influencer in Security 2022, under the cybersecurity professionals category. He was also recognized in 2018 as the cybersecurity ch champion in uh, Cybersecurity Experts Association of Nigeria. And also, uh, our last but not least, online speaker, Muhammad Ali Yahuwar, uh, who is a member of Youth Standing Group. Uh, he is a computer engineer and an AI researcher, currently studying for his Master of Science in Computer Science with specialization in systems and artificial intelligence. His interest lies in the intersection of privacy, security, and AI. He is a Padawan Fellow at Open Minded, Open Minded, developing privacy preserving AI tools. He also holds the position of secretary at the Internet Society Youth Standing Group. So these are our brilliant speakers here today with us. And as I mentioned before, in the first part, Tanti will give us the presentation. Uh, of the results of the research by uh, the Dynamic Coalition. But firstly, uh, we would like to ask you two questions using the online tool Mentimeter about what are your predictions, uh, how the research, uh, how the research results will look like. So let me share my screen. Uh, could you please make me a co-host? Okay, that's not I wanted to share. Okay, you should be able to see a QR code. You can scan it with your phone or you can go on the www.menti.com and use the code 2677631010. Uh, I will give you a moment to do that. It's uh, one more time, it is www.menti.com. And the code is two six seven seven six three one zero. OK, 
Okay, let's go to the first question. Uh, still, if somebody didn't uh, hasn't joined already, you have also caught there. You can see. Oh, yeah, much better. Thank you. Okay, so here is the first question. I think I can move this thing here. So please put your answers here and I will quickly uh, in a moment show you the correct answer. Okay, one more minute. Okay, I think the statistics stopped already. So let me show you the... Oh! <laughs> okay, two people. Okay. <laughs> you are making it difficult to choose the perfect moment to show the answer. Okay, let me show you. Okay. Yeah, and the most of you choose correctly. It's problem solving and teamwork. So let's get to the second question. No, it wasn't the end. Okay. Okay, like 10 seconds more. Okay, thank you to everyone who filled the pool. And the correct answer is cybersecurity manager. So, only seven. Okay, <laughs> I saw that one more vote after revealing the answer. Sorry, it doesn't count. Uh, so seven people actually got it, cor uh, chose the correct answer. So now I'm passing the floor to Tantia, who will explain you more why we have results as these ones. Tantia, the floor is yours. Thank you. And you can start. Um, yeah, my presentation is starting and uh, Emilia already introduced myself, but I will quickly do that as well. Uh, my name is Steuntje Manders, I'm from the Netherlands and um, I actually study translation. And while working as a freelance translator, I translated a book, a workbook for children on how to use the internet in a safe way. Um, which passwords to use, not to use your, your birthday as your password for everything. And I realized that I found that super interesting and it really became a passion of mine, um, which is why I was sent to the, to the IGF and this is my first IGF. So thank you all for being here. And um, yeah, what I'm going to be talking about is um, the research that I did with the IS3C. 
um, the research is about closing the gap between the needs of the cybersecurity sector and the skills of tertiary education graduates. Now, um, quickly something about the IS3C. The IS3C is the Internet Standards Security and Safety Coalition. It was set up here at the IGF in 2020 uh, by my colleague Wout de Natris. And by now there are six working groups um, working on different subjects and mine is one of them. The research that we did consisted of three different steps. The first step was um, conducting interviews with cybersecurity industry leaders in uh, 16 different countries. The next step was desktop research and the final step was a survey that we sent out and we received, um, res we received answers from respondents over 65 countries. The interviews consisted of three categories. We, they existed of competences, requirements, challenges and best practices. The result was this model of transversal and professional competences. And next was a survey. The survey was created to collect quantitative data, to confirm the competence model as we have it here, to define the gap that there is and to collect further examples of good practices. So the report isn't officially presented yet. So you all get a very secret sneak peek. Um, it will be presented in like uh, 20 minutes. So I have to apologize because I will be needed there. Um, but I'm going to give you the results already to make up. Um, what, we res what, what we learned from the research that we did is uh, we got a clear image of the transversal and professional competences that are needed in the cybersecurity industry. Um, the rating of transversal competences of graduates in the cybersecurity industry is roughly good to average. Um, there's certainly a big interest for the subject and um, less than 50% of industry rates the level of graduates as too low or moderate. The impact on companies is big and as I and probably you as well have heard multiple times during the IGF is that there are too little women and too little youth um, working in the sector. And to conclude all of that, yes, there is a gap. However, um, the IS3C also came up with some recommendations. Um, and the recommendations that we noted uh, is to improve education and training and to make teaching less theoretical and more connected to everyday issues. We, um, awareness needs to be raised, uh, no, sorry, uh, importance needs to be added to the cybersecurity at all levels of education. Cybersecurity is a personal responsibility like health and well-being and it should be included in education, in the education curriculum at all levels of education to make the internet a safer place. Next, um, the collaboration between industry and education must be improved. This will make sure that education stays up to date on emerging technology, technology trends, has greater access to up-to-date resources um, and a better understanding of the current competences competence requirements. Then diversity needs to be boosted. Women and young people must be encouraged to work in the cybersecurity factor, uh, sector. Um, diversity is necessary everywhere, but also in the technology. And lastly, um, the recruitment procedures must be upgraded. A career in cybersecurity could be more attractive to young people, especially girls, if during their childhood and teenage years, they could discover the exciting challenges, opportunities and flexibility that this field has to offer. So what the IS3C can do here and what we plan to do in the future um, is that we could set up a hub um, that could act as observatory of good practices um, and ensure ongoing dialogue. 
We could help raising awareness in industry about the advantages of establishing a closer cooperation with education sectors for exchange of information in order to support development of better adapted teaching programs. Um, we could help with capacity building to promote knowledge sharing across sectors, for example, through train the teacher programs. Um, we could help encouraging and supporting uh, the participation of under 30 and uh, of the under 30 group and women in capacity building the in capacity building programs developed with representatives of industry. And um, we would support the revision and update of education curricula and the development of targeted teaching and learning resources. Um, and perhaps a last one that you, oh no, that you can see there, uh, would be setting up a training program for the Global South. So that was basically it on the report. Um, as I said, I will have to leave in a bit, but um, please feel free to reach out to me either on LinkedIn on the email address that was just shown um, or through the website. The report will be visible there as well soon. And if you would like to share any input on education, on if you're from the cybersecurity sector, these steps, we still have to take them and we can always use input. We can also, also always use funding as a small no, remark. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that was my story. Thank you so much for giving me the, the time to say this. Thank you for listening and uh, back to you. Thank you a lot, Dantia. I think it was a very interesting research and presentation. And I think it's an honor that we were one of the first audiences to hear it. So thank you a lot. And don't worry <laughs> about going to the other session. Like We totally get it. So with that, uh, I would like to move to the next part of our panel, which is the first round of uh, uh, speakers' inputs. The first speaker will be Nancy, uh, Nancy Yoki Vahira. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and it's a pleasure to participate in this session. I am so glad because skills for tomorrow and being a youth in the cybersecurity market is something that young people, we are looking forward to getting into this career. And it's good that we have this conversation so that those who are coming who are coming after us can have a perspective on where to begin and how to grow in their journey. So my perspective about what education barriers to observe or have experience in cybersecurity market. To begin with, most programs that we get into cybersecurity, we start by being taught or rather going through the emphasis of security planning compliance and maybe learning more about auditing and reporting and like getting real skills on deeper technical perspective so that as a young person you understand what you're learning in cybersecurity and how you can scale up to even contribute in policy meetings. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Nancy. And now I would like to give the floor to our online speaker, Mohammed. Mohammed, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. So, uh, I would basically like to talk about um, the landscape of cybersecurity education in India. What happens in India is that the first thing is that, that uh, cybersecurity as a profession is not that uh, popular in India. The reason is that we don't have that much of good cybersecurity undergrad undergraduate programs, first of all. And I mean, there are uh, the problems are manifold. First is like the incentive is not there for actually we pursuing a career in cybersecurity, and then the uh, not a very clear pathways there for to follow for any potential. Uh, if I want to become a cybersecurity expert or cybersecurity professional, I don't have any fixed pathway that I could I would like to take 
เด็ดพุดนะครับ make me a good now successful cybersecurity professional so when you are talking about hurdles that we have there are many for one particular that uh, the uh, survey the research paper from uh, 20 year old already highlighted is that uh, we have a lot of gap in the theory that we teach in this universities and the practice that we actually require in the job market so what i would say is the biggest hurdle is that we need to close this gap close this uh, remove this barrier of the difference in the landscape of what we have in the university how we teach the students what we teach them and what actually comes and in practice in the industry or uh, in the government so with that i would like to uh, pass over to the next speaker and we'll come back to my points later thank you at mohammad and uh, with that as mohammad already passed the floor i'm giving it to samaila thank you emilia um, and and thanks for having me on this on this session so i think like most of you have realized the the issues would vary from one country to the other so some some people will talk about um barriers in terms of lack of job opportunities others will talk about the lack of um educational programs you know in the universities for instance in my country i think there's just about five schools who have university programs and i don't think any of the programs is up to 5 years old so you can imagine when a country where we have about um i think over 40 million people using bank accounts who have to use internet banking and things like this but how who has who are people that supposed to protect the infrastructure in the banks right so we find out that a lot of people who work in our sector are probably trained outside the country maybe in europe you know <laughs> and we come back home to try and fix things but that's that's the situation there um i think also because of the the lack of um will i say seamless integration with the industry between the the academia industry a lot of the skills that are taught are not really relevant for today's like in today's application so we're in a situation where the curriculum is outdated you know and there's no political will in quote to to fix that and to make it you know modern so that it can solve to these problems we also don't have the situation where um, the industry for instance maybe the banking sector is saying to the schools we need these three core skills to fill these kind of gaps because it's causing this kind of loss to the economy and to the banks you know and that doesn't transfer into revised curriculum so there's that there's that gap there's also the issue of poverty you know um people want to get into security but how many of them have computers i don't want to go into the issue of infrastructure but i'm sure we all know that that's another issue in africa so i'm just going to stop there so i don't raise too many issues okay yeah you will have two more rounds of inputs to <laughs> touch on them so don't worry and now i'm passing the floor to anna hello thank you very much uh, hello everyone um actually the gaps of cybersecurity is an issue of um of such a great concept as for example lifelong learning like for example myself when i started journalism media economic there was no social media at all <laughs> when i started my first job as public relations manager and in csr there was no social media at all <laughs> so like we really must have an ability to adapt otherwise we we cannot exist in the profession that uh, that appears in the future uh it's uh, it touches such great concepts as um inclusiveness right like we've heard in the very beginning uh like openness to innovation and change um and actually digital technologies also entered all absolutely all part of life so everyone like each citizen will will face somehow even in his personal private life some issues related to cybersecurity to safety to to technical security and of course therefore we need more and more and more experts that's why we sit here that's why we think because it it touches our life it's not something like hmm let's find experts in cybersecurity it's our life is so much related to cybersecurity our money are related to cybersecurity that's why it's so, so so crucial that we talk about it and this in this debate i represent uh, the area of developing digital skills of young people of children uh 
mostly uh, from the perspective of their safety, but also from the perspective of raising and developing the digital, di their digital competences, we run a Polish Safer Internet Center. It's a center that has awareness activities, but it also helps kids uh, in everyday life related to um, cyberbullying, uh, when they face hate, we have helplines for them. We also deal with illegal content. So these are the actions that we do uh, all the time, but also doing the awareness part. We, of course, deliver to schools lots of materials, but before we deliver the materials to schools, the, the resources that teachers need, we check what they need, we check what are uh, the biggest, uh, their biggest challenges. And I would like to share with you some data that we got from the recent um, report, from the recent, like it was a little research we've done among um, Polish teachers. And what they said, 30% they, uh, of teachers say that the area of online safety is absolutely too rarely discussed in schools. Almost 30% uh, say that there is a lack of teachers with appropriate competences. And this is the huge problem because when we, when we have experts in cybersecurity, they don't go to schools, <laughs> especially they don't go to primary school. Of course, it differs on country, but in Poland, teachers earn really little money. <laughs> So, the, as you can imagine, they are not full of cybersecurity experts. Uh, almost 30 percent, uh, no, 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 now we go do do do. Almost 60 percent say that the curriculum is not adapted to the realities of technological development, so it changes not fast enough. Almost 60 percent say that there is no time in the curriculum to properly develop this subject. Even if there is a competent teacher, she or he, would say, I have completely no time. <laughs> I have like maybe two hours uh, a week. And that would be a, a lot to talk about uh, the safety. And they, they know that they need absolutely more. And all of them, uh, they are absolutely sure that this topic is, is, is absolutely crucial. And they need to uh, initiate students' interest in this subject in, and in developing their careers in these directions. And they are also totally sure that it should be implemented from the earliest level of education. And this is also what we've heard from the report. Uh, and teachers point also the important role of parents because it's also crucial to have aware parents who know that they also, of course, basing on kids' passions, on kids' interests, because we can't have all the cybersecurity experts in the world. But if they see the potential, they can also help schools to, 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 to yeah, like lead kids into mm, developing those passions. So therefore, we see lots of challenges. We, have, we see challenges in front of schools and really like primary and secondary schools, because this is when all starting to happen and the uh, big challenges um, at home. Thank you for now. Uh, thank you a lot, Anna. And without any further delay, uh, I am starting the second round of inputs from speakers. So the order will be the same. So Nancy. Okay, I also have a perspective of um, the question of how official education path has prepared for a career in cybersecurity. So to my opinion, you might, as a young person, you might be the most technical capable applicant in an interview room, but you may not be able to get the job in cybersecurity. Reason because we have similar and well-developed set of skills that young people need to acquire, not only the technical skills that can enable them get a job. So if you are a people-centered person, employers are looking for technical skills as well as knowledge, and, but they're also looking for someone who can get along with people and someone who can work in an environment with diversity and still deliver results. So as young people, we need soft skills more, which we call them human skills, apart from the technical skills of excelling in a job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, person speaking will be Mahomat. Ah, great. Um, I would just like to first comment on a few things that uh, both Anya and Samara say. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I agree with that thought that uh, the landscape that we are living in, that we are working in, changes a lot. So, we need to be very quick in adapting to those challenges that they bring. And we, I also agree with one point that you said that is maybe similar to what is happening in India as well, is that we like the quality 
in the faculties that teach at the universities in India. I guess that is because of the immense brain drain that we have, uh, we incur in almost all fields in India. So maybe that is the effect of that. But yeah, we have we have, for example, a lot of good technical institutes, but the issue is that most of the technical institute, they have very specific research capabilities in cybersecurity, and uh, they all work kind of very, I mean, not very in, in a very coherent way. So that, uh, so the issue is that we don't have a very good program in a single university, for example. Um, also, adding to Samara's point, I would like to say that the problems that is stated about Nigeria, especially regarding the lack of courses, lack of programs in universities, or maybe even the universities that actually have the programs, they are very new. I mean, it is a problem that is like uh, synonymous with the whole global South. And even in, in many European countries, we would say we would see that it is a problem that is everywhere. And what I see, particularly in the context of India, is that the reason behind this, all these problems, maybe currently, uh, I would not like to actually target other fields, but what I'm saying is that because of the popularity of artificial intelligence and data science, so most of the programs right now, um, they focus on these topics only. I mean, that makes uh, sense like financially, but in the long term for a country or maybe for the uh, ecosystem, it doesn't fare well. And then we also have a big problem in the actual job market. There's a catch-22 situation kind of. Companies, they don't actually want to invest in training their employees or maybe the fresh graduates for the cyber security role. The thing is that the graduates that we have, they are, for example, being a computer engineer a graduate, I have a wide, you know, have a widespread capability, which I can be trained to become a cyber security professional, but companies are not willing to take that bet. And they only want a skilled professional. So this creates a very disadvantage for fresh college graduate, and they have to take additional training programs, which sometimes like cost even greater than a full four year undergrad program. So all this, uh, many issues, they put the fresh graduates at a very disadvantageous position in the job market. And even though we have a lot of unfulfilled uh, positions for cyber security professionals in India, we uh, more than 50% is left uh, unattended right now. So, okay, uh, I will stop with that. Thank you. Thank you, Samayila. I think I would um, I will continue from where Mohammed stopped. He he mentioned something about um, lack of entry level opportunities, and again using Nigeria as as as, um, as my case study, you see a situation where a lot of companies all want to hire people who have about maybe six, eight, ten years experience in the industry, and no one wants to hire someone with zero, one, maybe two years experience, because you know nobody wants. Um, let's say raw talent, they want finished products. They want someone that can come on day one and wow everybody. But it, the, what, 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 what happens over time is you have an industry where some people who can't find jobs end up going back to software development, you know, going back to similar industries or other emerging technology like um, blockchain, for instance, or Web3, NFTs, or, and things like that, because they see that at least they can freelance do some of those roles and get paid. The issue now is that over time, when those um, skilled people decide to upgrade, maybe go to Netherlands or Canada or UK, like we're seeing every day now, those vacancies become open and there's nobody that has maybe four years experience or five years experience or six years experience to fill those roles. And that is why the report, which is quite accurate, said that the, one of the hardest roles to fill is cyber security manager. Is that's very true for many countries because a lot of times those people at that level, you, you can imagine 50 companies fighting for the same 10 people. So you work here for six months and you get a new offer. They are literally begging you to take this offer. They ask you, what are you, what are you earning? We'll double it. 
So, but nobody wants to start with the person with zero experience or one year or two years because they don't want to spend time training the person. They are, they are, there's also this fear that, oh, if I train the person, then the person leaves. The issue is that if you don't train the person, then the role is vacant and the problem still persists, right? So at some point, I think in industry, we need to be honest with ourselves and realize that we need to do these things to create what we call a talent pipeline, where you have people who are doing internships while they're still in university. We have people doing internships before they even get into university, so they're getting some experience, some insights into the industry. So that at the point of graduation, they are not just coming with theoretical knowledge from the classroom, where they've been taught by a lecturer who just read some slides. They're coming with practical skills they've, uh, they've gained during their internships. And luckily, if the educational sector improves or if the curriculum becomes better, then we have them learning practical skills using real world tools that they will eventually get to use on the job because there's a huge difference between what they do in class and then what they meet in the industry. And so that's why a lot of employers really do not like hiring that entry level person because they spend a lot of money and time having to train. Meanwhile, they want someone that can hit the ground running on day one. Second thing I'll mention now is HR processes. And again, I'm happy the reports showed that um, because this issue is also like a HR problem. It's human resource we're talking about, right? So, but I'm happy. I, I, I was in a session not too long ago with some HR people, right? And we're talking about this this kind of topic. And I was I was surprised and impressed to find out that some companies now are reducing the barriers to entry. And what do I mean? They are they are reducing. They are relegating things like maybe a master's degree to the back. It's no more like a number one requirement, like a compulsory requirement. It's now like a nice to have, right? We are seeing situations where employers are now changing their recruitment processes so that they are testing for your actual skills, not just asking you the generic question that anybody can Google and know the answer and pass an interview. Because I, I tell you, if I, I, there are like five questions you come across in every Sarasquit interview in any country in the world. You can ask people in the industry, they'll tell you. So how do you filter the good ones when anyone can Google the answers and they already know the questions you're going to ask before they come for the interview? So we're having people now refine their recruitment processes to test. So if a role says, if a role is for what we call SOC analysis, someone who is meant to manage devices and see logs and respond to incidents, then they ask questions along those lines. They may even give you a practical session to show that you have those skills. So I think if the HR processes keep evolving in this way, then they are less likely, we, are le we are less likely to have um, this gap because more people who are suited for roles will be found and will be hired. Um, so thank you. Thank you a lot. And Anna? Yeah, in this speaking uh, opportunity, I would like to go back to the problematics of the inclusiveness. Mm, because actually the key element, one of the key elements of reaching the cybersecurity experts, uh, but above all of reaching the holistic perspective to the topic, the, to the holistic perspective of the problematics and the wide perspective also of needs of the society is to be inclusive and to have more women. Uh, that's what, we, what we've heard in the report, to have more women in cybersecurity uh, environment within cybersecurity experts. And it has also another dimension. Uh, maybe many of you knows, but women are also um, vulnerable to some certain types of harms that happens online. Uh, it was also said during many these IGF sessions that women uh, often suffer more from sexting situations, especially when the material leaks, then the women are most frequently the really big victims of that situation. Women are very often attacks online. Women are very often uh, victims of sextortion. So actually having more women as cybersecurity experts might be even better for the better uh, security of girls using uh, and, and women using uh, using network um, and prevent these dangers. And of course, as we said before, the effort to bring them must start at the very early levels of education. And they should be especially encouraged also during the computer classes, because we know also from the research that very often they're not so much like paid attention by the teacher during the class. The, these are boys who are more paid attention. Uh, there is lots of like cultural bias in all these processes. Uh, very often the um, IT teacher that would be a man. Uh, very often at home, and we also know it from the research, I know it by myself from the IDIs, those interviews that I've done uh, within one of the, um, of the um, research that, I, that, I've, that I've done with the families. It was the research about um, IT practices at homes. And really, uh, in, 
it was the uh, interview in Poland, but I think that it also happens in many, many other countries. These are fathers who buy technology, who decide on what technology to use, who fix all the, the, all the IT tools at home. So we still have, it's, it's really quite a gender-based um, activity and it doesn't make girls to be more like actively participating in this part of, uh, of technology, even at homes. Uh, academia have also lots to, to do uh, because it is said that if you see like a role model, so if you have like a professor in the academy, that would be, for example, a woman or a representative of the minority, then it gives like a good example to the students that they can also uh, choose this path. Uh, it's also very good to involve some uh, succeeding uh, representative of minorities to speak to students, to show how they could do it, how they, um, how they uh, were able to, to, to succeed. Uh, however, of course, the problem doesn't stop there because we have we can have lots of willing and uh, um, women that being ready even coming from the education like really ready but then we have lots of managers who don't know how to be inclusive and are not really open so we need lots of lots of trainings for managers lots of training for businesses still we think that lots of things have been done but there's really a lot a lot to be done in the future as well thank you a lot <coughs> Thank you to all the speakers for this second round of inputs. And now I would like to ask our audience, both on-site and online, if you have any questions to our speakers, because uh, now we will have a moment to ask them. Uh, those online can write them in the chat and those on-site can raise their hand. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your contributions. I thoroughly enjoyed them. My name is Ethan. I am a tech lawyer at Access Partnership and also an ISOC IGF Youth Global Youth Ambassador. Um, so my question, I have a question and I have a statement. Um, the question is really um, speaks, speaking to the cultural aspect of things and maybe I'm talking in an African context, but what can we do to address the cultural um, barrier to accessing job, the cybersecurity job market. And I mean, if you ask my, my parents, they would have told, they will tell you, um, and they told me that I should be a doctor or a pilot, you know. So we have these things as Africans, these career paths that we are expected to take because those are the ones that we know, those are the ones that we're comfortable with. Um, and perhaps that links to a point that one of the panelists was talking about, which is around poverty. Um, because those are the, again, career paths that we know are stable. Um, so there's a big cultural, essentially, is my, my, my question is, there's a cultural aspect to this. How can we address that to ensure that going forward, um, there is excitement if, as a youth, if I'm excited about being in the uh, cyber security sector, um, there's, there's support structures around that in our cultures, in our communities, um, to, to encourage uh, participation in the sector. And then the statement um, is really uh, on more practical on more practical terms, I think we should and we can, as a sector, just say there will no longer be unpaid internships in in this sector. Because, again, it links to this whole story, because if now I'm trying to do this cybersecurity thing, um, and I've left the whole uh, doctor and pilot course, um, and it's it's not as stable. It's not working out. I'm not being paid as a as a young intern trying to get the experience that I need to be valued in this sector, um, and the skill sets that I need to be valued in this sector. It's a hard journey, um, and often many of our youth are are turning away from it. Um, and these these are conversations that we could speak on on a personal note, and conversations that we've had with many African youth around this. Um, they end up just going back to 
uh, the, 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 the traditional career paths. And then they also in turn told, tell their kids, now you must be a doctor, you must be a pilot. And that's not to say we don't uh, appreciate the doctors in the room um, and pilots, but effectively there are practical issues too. So cultural and practical issues, um, what can we do about that is my question. Everybody wants to respond. <laughs> now, just very shortly, and I will pass to, to another speaker. Very shortly, I think uh, all of what you said is a matter of awareness. Actually, uh, the sector of cybersecurity is, for example, in Poland, is very much understood as a sector with lots of money. So we don't need this kind of... Um, of explaining to the society because yeah for the IT people there's always some some job waiting and it seems like a really really stable uh, stable job um, but awareness comes with uh, uh, with uh, cooperation and with alliances so the best way is always to to build a big network of stakeholders to have uh, on board uh, government to have non-governmental organizations and to have media and then like building but uh, real real alliances really real cooperations we can get to the people with uh, with the knowledge you would like to pass i mean anna has basically said what i was going to say <laughs> so i won't touch on awareness anymore um, and I, I like what you said about, you know, as an industry agreeing, you know, that, uh, to, to, to make the job worthwhile, you know, for the employees, you don't want to hire someone, the person feels as if I need to work three more jobs, you know, to feed myself, then they wouldn't give out their all in the office because they're thinking of the other jobs they have to do. They're trying to close quick and r run to the next job. So if you really want, I think we're at the point where if you want people to be focused and you want people to give their best on the job, then the job needs to be worth their well. Remember that, like I mentioned earlier, we're in what we're calling now in Nigeria, um, the Japa syndrome, which is like a mass exodus. We're having the most skilled tech people leaving the country for better, for greener pasture, for better jobs in other countries. And so if you, do, if you don't make your work environment, you know, enticing, if you don't make the, the, the financial benefits enticing, other benefits, you know, how do you want to attract the best talent? Um, so I think another thing that is practical that can be done and I think which we are already doing in, in Nigeria is we've we've had conversations within um, ourselves, at least some of us who are familiar in the NGO space, um, and we're we're trying to see how we can create opportunities for this internship. We, we we're, we're talking to our friends, you know, who are CISOs, who are CTOs, who are CEOs. You know, can you create certain internships for three months, four months, six months, where these young people can come and learn? Can you also do you have room, you know, for one more entry level person? You know, and then to piggyback on that, we're having um, a lot of people now who are organizing mentorship programs, who are organizing webinars for entry-level people. I know I've spoken in about maybe four or five just this year alone. You know, so there, that, there's that much effort and collaboration within the Nigerian cybersecurity industry to create, you know, build these skills in these new in these new ones, and to also create opportunities for them to get to work because that's the only way they'll feel fulfilled. Because everyone wants to be able to earn a living to feel fulfilled. And about the cultural aspect of the jobs, such as doctor and lawyers, I think it will begin with our mindset and educating those who are ahead of us, those who may not have a different perspective about new jobs in cybersecurity and the stability. Maybe they haven't seen really successful people in the IT who make good money, like those who are in maybe doctors and lawyers. So a different perspective of mindset will also help us overcome the cultural bias. Thank you. Thank you. And also, Mohammed uh, would like to say something. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, we talk about money all the time. I mean, that is good. That's what we actually want. But uh, uh, what I say is that in the future, a lot of cyber security jobs will be created by the government service. Because cybersecurity is like a two-way fall. A lot of attacks happen. We need people to defend as well outside the companies or maybe the financial institutions. We also need protection in the public spaces as well. So what I would like to highlight is that apart from the money, we also have a kind of prestige uh, perspective as well. 
in essence, uh, maybe in the defense forces or maybe uh, in more in general in the police, we can have uh, the, the same contribution to our society as a cyber security professional working for the government or government agencies or maybe government entities that maybe an honest police officer has who works to protect the people, protect the country and everything. So we also need to look into this aspect as well because honestly in the future, more jobs will be created for cyber security professional in the government sector than maybe in the industrial sector. So I guess that would be a good incentive as well. Thank you. And I hope uh, this uh, respond the speakers responded to your question. And uh, now we have another hands up uh, in our chat. Uh, so, uh, Nicolas, uh, you can take the floor. Good afternoon. good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody. My name is Lenin. I'm an Internet Society Youth Ambassador, and I'm happy to also be a lawyer who is interested in tech law. I have a master's in tech media and telecommunications. I wanted to respond to the cultural question that my colleague Ethan asked. I think that those of us who have younger siblings have a role to play in shaping our parents' perspective on what are considered traditional and profitable uh, professions. What I noticed is that my parents, for instance, take my word and what I have to say as an elder brother very important when it comes to my younger siblings trajectory of education and so personally what i've done is that i have a younger brother is about 10 years old i enrolled him in a boot camp and on vacation he goes to coding classes and those things he started designing stuff and i noticed that my parents were getting fascinated by the fact that he can do those things and i've also realized particularly within cyber security that when you learn the skills early enough, you're actually able to do gigs and make money of it even way before you are formally employed into a sector. So I would encourage, particularly those of us from the African side, that those of us with younger siblings should make it a point to expose our younger siblings to acquiring these skills early so that our parents can perhaps see the value of those skills in order to reshape their perceptions on the traditional doctor lawyer pilot rules thank you uh, thank you a lot would any of panelists uh, would like to respond or somebody in the audience i saw somebody yeah well good afternoon everyone uh, my name is cynthia chepkemoy i'm one of the isoc ambassadors 2022 and uh, one of the founding leaders of the Association of Privacy Lawyers in Africa. And I would like to contribute to the uh, discussion that you are having today. I really get excited when I get in rooms where we discuss cyber security because as a woman, I'm one of the beneficiaries of uh, CyberSafe Foundation, a foundation in Nigeria, and I was trained in cyber security. And with my background in legal, uh, it really becomes difficult to prosecute matters touching on cyber security in court. And the seven months program really gave me, gave me an opportunity to understand cyber security govern governance, risk and compliance to a point. What really got me excited was actually analyzing a malware and conducting a malware analysis, a skill I, I, did, I couldn't even learn in law school or anywhere else. But with the program, um, I, I, I really appreciate the CyberSafe Foundation uh, CEO and uh, it's being trickled down to other African countries and we are even having one of the programs starting next year in Kenya and I'm open to mentoring more youths because I meet very many young women asking me how did you get into the space and it's an exciting space to be. My phone is always ringing, people want me to work for them but then I, it's only one Cynthia, there's no other Cynthia. So we really need to build capacity and have more women in the space and youth in the space and even children. And adding to what Lenin is uh, talking about in terms of cultural perspective and changing it uh, in, in a professional setup then, uh, we have many you know, students joining universities, but then they tend to take up courses that are not really current 
the old uh, regime courses, as you had really earlier said, but then with advancement in technology and digital advancement, then it means we really need to take up courses that are relevant and applicable to the current industry standards. Yeah, that's my contribution. Thank you. Uh, thank you a lot, Cynthia. Uh, do we have uh, any other contributions from the audience, on-site or online? Okay. Um, okay, good afternoon. I mean, this is a very great panel. <laughs> yeah, um, my name is Ismela Jawara from the Gambia, once again. Um, I just have a contribution to actually make. Um, I mean, I learn a lot from here, but also I want to take the Gambia as a case study. Um, in my country, we have less than five cybersecurity experts that I know of. So, yeah, so uh, I work for the government. I am in civil society and I do a lot of things. So, like you mentioned, you see, you receive a lot of job offers outside you know, always traveling to Ghana and other places. But I mean, around two years ago, that is something that, you know, we came up with, that is trying to give back to the community. And this obviously involved or include us. If the government doesn't change the curriculum, I can, like we cannot think of taking the curriculum to the government, I mean, to the institutions, the schools. So what we did is we created a community, you know, cybersecurity, you know, community and started creating hubs in universities and colleges. So you see, uh, you will have students that are studying HR and we kind of tell them, you know what, cybersecurity is not all about technical, like you have other areas that HR people can come into, you know, and that has actually proven to be very, very useful. And the other recommendation that I think um, I would want to make is that from within, you know, not just our country, but within Africa, we should create these synergies and also connect. But what I mean by this is that we are very limited you know, experts in the whole continent. And you have a whole lot of, you know, job opportunities. And you also have a whole lot of people that want to join the, you know, industry, but they don't have people to mentor them. So you see, and, you know, a five people expert in a, you know, population of 2.5 million people, you know, it, it became very, very difficult to mentor all those people. So when you open applications, you know, for people to apply, you have 100 people, but just, you know, 20 seats. You know, you're denying almost 80 people, you know, access to the, the same industry. So the other thing that we did is, okay, you don't have to, you know, be a cybersecurity expert to work for a bank to earn money. So we kind of introduced bulk bounty programs that these are some, some of the online jobs that you can get to kind of have. But all this, you will need mentors. You know, and when we create those synergies, you know, within Africa alone, because of so many reasons and the global world, it will, it will make the work very easier and then we'll have more people into the industry. You know, and this has actually so showcased, you know, something two weeks ago when our central bank was hit by ransomware and you have only two people were in the country to go and check that. So, you know, I mean, the government is now thinking, what are we going to do about this? You know, and I'm too busy somewhere. Someone is too busy somewhere. They have to import people from U.S. to pay them a huge amount of dollars, you know, and, you know, the bank probably will be bankrupt or maybe the company will go. So you see, this is a challenge, you know, so thank you so much. Thank you a lot. And we also, okay, here is one more hand. And firstly, there was hand here. So we'll go this and this. And here also. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, I am Aris. I am from the Philippines. I think I am the farthest person <laughs> in terms of geographical here currently. And uh, what's uh, what sparked my interest is that uh, earlier when I was listening to the, the presentation, it was mentioned there that um, learning, you know, learn the awareness level of uh, students whenever they are going to start learning up to the point that they are going to go into their respective careers. And it is really important for us to be able to maintain digital competence and include it with regards to, because digital competence also includes safety. 
And when we talk about safety, cybersecurity is also included there. So if we are going to maybe include it, maybe, I don't know, it would be not really a framework because we really cannot force governments, just like what my friend here has mentioned earlier. You cannot really force governments to, to provide guidelines for us to be able to shape up the curriculum. But, you know, schools can do it on their own little way. It's, there are a lot of frameworks out there and they just have to get some of those and apply it within themselves. And it will really be good to expose students as young as they are with regards to concepts within cybersecurity. And with regards to the cultural uh, thing <laughs> earlier, maybe that, if we're going to start early, they might change their perspective because they might get the interests uh, while they are learning it from the beginning that they started learning and it will be more on developmental because the curriculum is said so. So if they would be able to get that interest, it would really not be very, very difficult for them to go into that field. But one thing that is really, really important is that we really need to give opportunities for these specific students to learn and also maybe to practice what they have learned. Because if we're not going to give opportunities for them, that will be very, very difficult also. And, you know, it will bring down their interest. So thank you so much. Thank you. And we have had uh, uh, hands up somewhere in that quarter, two hands up. Okay, so who was the first one? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Simba. Um, first, thank you very much for allowing me to, to put through a couple of comments. The first is I'm very encouraged by, by this panel um, because there were more women <laughs> than men. Um, for that reason alone, I'm, I'm encouraged that, um, that the world is headed in the right direction. Um, <laughs> uh, my questions are sort of a reflection a little bit on my colleague from Gambia, his point around the, the bank. And one of the things that I was raising is I think, I suspect, uh, and you know, I must just put a proviso and say that I'm not, not even not really, I'm not in the cybersecurity space at all. Um, I work with SMEs, particularly those in uh, green infrastructure and trade. Um, and, and so I think one of the things we found when asking them uh, about cybersecurity, because we're looking at those who are in the digital space a little bit, um, is, you know, what are your thoughts around digital and uh, around cybersecurity? And very few of them have anything to say about that. Um, and so I suspect there's an issue of having not been burnt. Um, you know, so if even a, a national government is, is waiting until their fingers get burnt, uh, what more for, for some of the smaller players uh, in the space to act? And I think my, my first question then is, how do we encourage them to, to act before getting their fingers burnt? You know, the, the proverbial parent telling you not to touch the plate. Um, how do we tell the SMEs this? Um, and then a second point around that is creation of this talent pipeline. Um, I liked the idea of this talent pipeline, um, but I find it at odds with the idea of unpaid internships, uh, particularly with these small businesses. And, and I think there's, there's a role that small businesses can play in, in the development of um, particularly those with very little experience. Um, and I would just like some comments around, yeah, around that. What role do you think small businesses can play in the training of uh, particularly the unexperienced? Thank you. Uh, thank you a lot. So we will collect just one more input uh, and then I will uh, pass the floor to our speakers to respond. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Mali Zalalem. I am from Ethiopia. Um, I am a manager of Elevate, which is a tech company. Uh, so currently we've identified all the problems and solution regarding cybersecurity and most of them, most of the problems being the lack of teachers, re resources, opportunities, infrastructures, and so on. And some of the solutions that uh, we've come up with are motivating the youth, especially women, 
um, working on education, internships, awareness, and so on. So um, one, of, one of my questions is, why haven't there been a platform where um, cybersecurity enthusiasts can come together and share information regarding cybersecurity? It could be um, creating uh, opportunities for each other or just sharing normal information with each other because um, awareness only, I don't think that'll cause a lot of um, good progress because uh, with the tech information that the youth have, it's easier to be, it's easier to cause harm and be uh, like a hacker and then sell information on the black market. Like they can make millions because they lack this uh, source and awareness and this internship opportunities that we've discussed about. So can we create this platform where the youth can come together and share knowledge with the different generations that have like already made it up there and have like the drops, the descriptions, and so on, so we can reduce the cyber attacks and being hackers to the youth. Uh, thank you a lot for all the questions and all the inputs. So now I am uh, giving the voice to our speakers, maybe in the same order as previously. So Nancy, start here. Okay. <laughs> okay, Anna, so you were <laughs> chosen to be the first one. But should we now address uh, what we've heard or also come up with our final statements? What, in what uh, moment we are? Both? <laughs> okay, oh my God, it was so many interesting things coming from the room. <laughs> I totally resonate with our colleague from Philippines and, uh, and what you said about the, the early education, because this is my, my, my field of, of my competences. Yes? So, the, so education is absolutely crucial because then you don't have those cultural bias because you learn from the very, big, very beginning. I'm not sure if I caught your, um, your idea uh, well uh, about those uh, fingers burnt, but uh, I would like to concentrate also on, on parents because uh, about parents and fighting those also cultural bias, uh, we have, uh, we observe two options. They all would like to be the, the guardians, like they to protect or make their kids addicted, <laughs> but they are very rarely uh, guides. So they don't like see themselves as the guides online as well, the guides of how the kid can uh, be expert in technology. They all give a phone, smartphone especially, or give technology and leave alone, or just, you know, perceive themselves as a, as a protectors, just not to happen something bad there. But they also need to be a guides also online, like they are a guides offline on how to develop, on how to, to, to become a professional in, uh, in life. And uh, <clears throat> what's also for me is very crucial are those trainings and courses. Because we, we've said a lot about early education, we've said a lot about inclusiveness, and we have many people who really would like to become uh, cybersecurity experts. We have people who would like to change jobs because together with the uh, digital revolution, we have many people who really will have to change jobs and to adapt to the world uh, that is changing. But it's a crucial, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge problem because as was said in the report, but it was also said here, I think among also speakers, there's a huge <coughs> expectation even for the entry level employees. So the, 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 the industry, industries always expect, the companies expect that you will come with a lot of experience that you don't actually have. So some free courses, free trainings, uh, cooperation between many different institutions to be able to finance also those trainings is really, really uh, on a huge uh, importance, I think, to, to get really cybersecurity people and to get cybersecurity people to the places that they are really, really needed, like we've heard here that there is only few of them and uh, the needs are, are absolutely enormous. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Anna. Maybe now I will give the floor to our online uh, panelist, uh, Mohamed. Oh, thank you. So, what I would like to uh, face the issue is that we are talking about cybersecurity because for the security of the digital space that is intertwined with our physical space. We need to have a very competent cybersecurity professional and a very competent pool of cybersecurity professional all over the world. So uh, what I am thinking is that we cannot solve this issue if we take different issues uh, separately. We need to think about it in a more holistic way. Perhaps we need to create an ecosystem 
perhaps an ecosystem of uh, demand of cybersecurity professionals and uh, corresponding to that, we should have a good training programs as well, in both in the universities and uh, other uh, diploma or polytechnics. So what I would say is that if you take an example of the JDPR, so what it did that it requires an appointment of a data protection officer. So what does a DPO does is that it is required by the GDPR for every organization to have a DPO. So what the GDPR created is that it created a demand of around 75K uh, DPO officers. And so what we could think from, what we could get from this pattern is that we don't have any security and privacy related framework in most of the countries around the world. It is limited to very few countries. So if we force our legislation, uh, our uh, member parliaments and all our other uh, legislative uh, bodies to frame, to come up with the frameworks for cybersecurity and privacy, we would in effect create a good ecosystem of a good uh, demand of cybersecurity professionals, which will be enforceable by law. Uh, so what would it would, in uh, effect, it is, uh, we would have a uh, more focus on training of such professionals. Uh, and with that, we would have a very good pipeline of uh, uh, cybersecurity institutions who are uh, producing cybersecurity professionals and who are easily employed by the different organizations all over the country. And uh, to answer, uh, one of the question from our uh, one of the participants uh, when we are talking about paid or unpaid internship it is a very big issue particularly as raised for small businesses many of them are not able to actually pay for internship but perhaps we may require some sort of arrangement where uh, training can happen but without incurring a cost on the organizations one option is that we could uh, instead, uh, award academic credits or certain internships. And yeah, I mean, that could be one option. And also, uh, right now, because we are actually uh, getting towards the conclusion of the session, I would like to highlight the recent developments of uh, cybersecurity in India. We have a data protection bill currently in India, as well as the amendment law for the uh, telecommunication bill as well. So what it has done, uh, similar to GDPR, it has also uh, make, made it a requirement that every organization should have certain privacy compliance officers and similar post. And what I am, uh, uh, what I think is that in the future it will create, it will force the universities and the other institution to create programs to cater to such positions, and it will in. Uh, in a sense, will create a lot of jobs and a lot of good uh, pipeline for uh, a healthy cybersecurity job involvement. Yeah, that is my input. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Mohammed and Nancy. I will contribute my answer to part of her question about young people and what they what they can do apart from creating awareness in the cyber security. I also think it's also an initiative by young people to reach out to those at least who have made progress in their career in cyber security to seek mentorship from them because it's different from when people seek something and when they are really curious to learn from those who have gone ahead, they can really benefit a lot and they can take less time to get to where they want to be than when they are trying to figure out everything on their own. And then as young people too, building our curiosity to a level whereby we are open to taking initiative and putting ourselves out there to show interest in things that we want that can really help us to move closer to our goal and to be professionals of today, not tomorrow, because we are living today. Thank you. Uh, so I guess I'm the one that is going to round up <laughs> since I've gotten to my class. And usually when you are speaking last, everyone has said all that can be said, but 
I'll see you find some some gaps as you were saying. So first of all, there's there's the, there's the I won't say misconception, but there's the belief that Sabbath is expensive, and in real sense it is. However, there are inexpensive ways to go about security. So I'll come to that in an uh, SMEs in a bit. But first, I want to talk about briefly just highlight that there's a role of government. Okay, no matter what you want, in in most in most countries, if not in every country, anything you want to do that has impacts nationally needs the government's input both financially the, polit the political will the policies and many other things the laws that will shape that that um, that shape and drive that initiative so i think it's a role of government in nigeria occasionally we have some some capacity building initiatives some seminars conferences some things along those lines to you know try and boost um, knowledge of the industry to raise the awareness like we're talking about here and so but there's, there's still a lot more that can be done by government obviously so i'm just trying to highlight that government has a role to play it's not all just on the heads of the smes and now coming to the smes you know i feel like they have less to lose sorry to put it that way but i feel like they have less to lose so it's the perfect you know it's like a fertile ground to come and practice and learn and so in an sme i feel like you have uh, there's more room for like an intern to practice certain things you know, worst case, you give them an isolated environment where they can't damage the production environment. Worst case. But I'm saying that um, because the organization is smaller, there are fewer maybe computers to monitor or servers to handle. There are fewer things to do generally. It's, it's, for me, I feel like it's the best place for an intern to learn. And then maybe going further, they can get what is in bigger organizations. But that's just, that's just my personal opinion anyways. Um, and I think SMEs are more in number than the big organizations i mean if if you want to compare how many organizations are as big as google you may not have more than maybe 500 in the whole world or maybe a thousand in the whole world but if you want to count the number of smes that use technology in nigeria alone so i'm sure we get the gist if every sme creates two internship positions we'll probably swallow up the the interns who are looking for opportunities so that's again my personal opinion um then like so, so like i said they're inexpensive approaches to security we have open source tools that can be used. A lot of organizations will give you some of their tools for free. Some will give you a trial period. Some will make it discounted or cheap. And it, this has spanned into the social security education industry. We now have platforms like Try Hack Me or Hack the Box and many others who are providing either free or cheap um, platforms that students can go and learn. And they are able to interact with some environments that mimic the real world environment. Excuse me. So someone who goes through that kind of program for four months, six months, you expect them to be at an advantage than someone who goes to a university for four years and they're just taught with presentation slides or even with the marker on the, on the board, right? And so I feel like we need to leverage these um, inexpensive avenues. And coming back to the SMEs, they can, like I said, you can leverage the tools. You can also, um, sorry, I just lost what I was about to say. <laughs> You can, you can leverage the tools and there's a lot of content online. You can go on YouTube. There, there, there are some podcasts that are daily, some are weekly, some are monthly. So you don't even need to be an expert to enlighten yourself about security. And for the SMEs, the their IT guy or their cyber guy can always get this free content online to equip themselves. And this, like I said, it ties back to education. And then on the question on collaboration, I feel like we are, we are trying as far as we can to be honest in it's really in nigeria and i think even to an extent in africa i'm not sure i go for any conference and i meet a security person from africa and we don't exchange our details and we don't try to think of what can we do together i think it's normal and at the very least we have a webinar at least on awareness you know or on how to get into the industry so i think to an extent it's some collaboration however i think it's hampered by funding a lot of us do these things out of pocket or, or voluntary so you can expect that there's limits to the impact you can you can make and i also think we're not enough like my brother from um, zambia gambia said he said there are just about five you know top people in nigeria i think uh, there's a report that said there are about 3500 certified so it may be more i mean but our population is over 200 million so <laughs> so <laughs> yeah so be just before you start clapping <laughs> So, so I think I think we're we're doing what we can. Again, we're not enough hands to mentor or to teach. There's no there, there are only so many hours in a day. 
we probably all have our day jobs so we are doing those things in our free time when we should be spending with family or sleeping or playing football or any other thing we like to do you know so i think th those are some of the limitations we have um okay i'm gonna skip my last point because somebody said a bit about it thank you uh, thank you a lot. So I think uh, that our speakers just did a very good wrap up of our session. So thank you a lot for being here, Anna, Nancy, Samaila and Mohammed online. Uh, a big thank you also to our online moderator who uh, has been making sure through the whole meeting that our Zoom participants are not being left alone without the right to have a voice. So big thank you to Pedro Lana from ISOC Brazil. And also thank you to our rapporteur, Rafał Prabutski from Silesian University Cyber Science. And a big thank you to our audience uh, for being very active participants. It was great to listen to your comments, uh, to your thoughts and for asking questions. It is always good to have uh, active people on site. So thank you a lot. And I really hope that it was an insightful uh, session for you. Thank you.